So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, welcome to the second, for those of you online, welcome to the second day of archival intelligence. And um, for everyone here who signed on as part of the member of the public, um, welcome to the panel Opening the Archive with Joel Sherwood Spring, Simon Sun, and Tammy Nguyen. This program is part of the National Gallery's October Gathering, which I'm sure everyone here is well aware, well aware of. Um, October Gathering is a series of programs that explores critical issues in the field of Southeast Asian art. The series features performance lectures, tours, readings of texts, closed door workshops, panel discussions like the one you're joining, film screenings, a mini exhibition, and a temporary library. Each program aims to take a closer look at prevailing art historical and musicological issues while creating space for dialogue, exchange, and free play. So, as part of October Gathering, opening, opening the archive, the panel you're now about to watch or participate in, um, explores different strategies for reclaiming and granting greater access to knowledge, from institutional partnerships to leveraging the public domains of specific nations and to the labor in, involved in creating resource guides, artworks. This panel considers the collective individual and individual efforts pursued in relation to art and the study of, cult and the study of art and culture. Um, these projects resist the foreclosure of who gets to study, write, and speak about our cultural histories. Today's panel runs for an hour. We, we will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the three presentations. So without further ado, it is actually my privilege to introduce today's speakers, and thank you three for giving us time. So today we have with us um, on stage Simon Soon, Joel Sher Sherwood Spring, and joining us from the US, Temi Nguyen. So if you give me a second, I will give you a little bit of background about Tammy Nguyen, and then we'll, um, I'll introduce Joel Sherwood Spring and Simon after. So Tammy Nguyen, uh, <clears throat> it creates paintings, drawings, artist books, prints, and zines that explore the intersections between geopolitics, ecology, and lesser known histories. A storyteller, Nguyen's multidisciplinary practice takes two forms. Her more traditional fine arts practice, which encompasses her lush, dense paintings, as well as her prints, drawings, and unique artist books, and her publishing practice embodied through her imprint, Passenger Pigeon Press, which creates and distributes Martha's Quarterly, which we'll learn a little more about. Martha's Quarterly is a subscription of artist books and interdisciplinary collaborations. Across both domains, Nguyen's work aims to unsettle, um, and emphasizes the tension between the artist's elegant forms and harmonious aesthetics. Um, it often belays the nature of her content. The confusion this dissonance creates becomes generative, opening space for reevaluation, radical thinking, and the dislodging of complacency. So she'll be our first speaker today. Our second speaker is Simon Soon, who's seated next to me. Simon Soon is a senior lecturer in the Visual Arts Department Culture Center, University of, of Malaya, Malaysia. His research focuses on 20th century art in Southeast Asia. He is a member of the editorial collective of Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art, and a team member of the Malaysia Design Archive. He... <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it's, it rolls off. Simon is obviously a very accomplished scholar in this field. And our final speaker for, day, for today will be Joel Sherwood Spring, um, who is an an uh, anti-disciplinary artist who works collaboratively on projects that sits outside established norms of contemporary art and architecture and attempting to transfigure spatial dynamics of power through discourse, pedagogies, art, design, and architectural practice. He focuses on um, the contested narratives of Australia's urban, cultural, and indigenous history in the face of ongoing colonialization. Um, without further ado, since I've taken a long time to read you their bios, but we are so privileged to have each of you with us today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tammy to give us our first presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I really wish that I was in Singapore right now. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, Hopefully this goes smooth, um, bear with me. Um, so my name is Tammy, as uh, Kathleen introduced. Um, I uh, make a whole bunch of different kinds of artwork and 
I am really interested in, in spaces in between subjects, in between times, in between people, in between interests. And Passenger Pigeon Press was something that I started in 2016 with the idea of nuance. It was, it was that it was a pursuit of nuance. And one of the reasons why I like using this word nuance as a way to describe Passenger Pigeon Press is because I was really interested in creating assertive works of art, um, which are embodied as books, you know, but explored subjects in ways that were inconclusive and sometimes confusing and, um, you know, somewhat unsettling, or there, there's kind of, um, there's no real beginning and no real ending. Um, and one of the sort of guiding questions that I have in this project and also in many of my other projects is the question of reading. How do you read? How do you read language? How do you read fiction? How do you read history? And in the context of this panel discussion, how do you read archival materials? How do you um, examine something that has been saved, um, whether it's a private archive or a public archive or, you know, an archive that is in a whole bunch of dusty boxes or an online archive. How do you bring material forward and, um, and, and, and make that um, into something that is experienced and, and perhaps compelling? Um, so, Passenger Pigeon Press has a whole bunch of different prongs to it, and I'm really going to talk about Martha's Quarterly and one collaboration. So Martha's Quarterly is a subscription of artist books. It comes and arrives um, at each season of the year. We make uh, 200 of them each season by hand, um, and they always have an experimental format. So here's a whole bunch of examples. We're actually at issue 25 now. Issue 25 is going to drop next week at the New York Art Book Fair. Um, here is an example of a whole bunch of them that are closed. And then in the next slide, you'll see this is how they open. So you can see that from this slide, they're intact and they can be mailed in an envelope or something like that. And then here, they open in a variety of ways. There are hidden cards, um, flaps that fold, um, little hidden pockets, things that fan out. Um, if you look even closer, some of them have little toys. Um, some of them have little scratchers and stickers and things like that. All of these mechanisms are ways in which I'm exploring this idea of reading. How do you engage um, an audience who is unfamiliar with your subject in an experience of reading that is playful and hopefully through that play, um, something could be seen anew, appreciated in a different kind of a way. Um, and then also um, the idea of regifting, you know, once it's uh, played with and it can kind of exist in one's personal library for a while and then it can be given away as, as, as a gift. Um, one of the important things about Martha's Quarterly is that it is a story that is told over time. It is something that arrives in the mail throughout the seasons of the year. There's a tempo, there is a thread because of the time and duration that it takes to tell this project and takes to realize this project. And also, you know, it was a way um, for me to kind of um, create a project where I might engage a certain audience who's interested in one Martha's Quarterly, but then have them excited about something that is totally going to be about something different. So this idea of connecting disparate subjects in serendipitous ways is something that is very exciting to me. Um, I'm going to highlight two Martha's Quarterlies that, or sorry, I'm going to highlight three Martha's Quarterlies that use um, the archive in hopefully in 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 a in a nuanced way, in a compelling way. This was the first Martha's Quarterly, um, and it this one really just is a um, a public domain document that kind of inspired the entire series. Um, so Martha's Quarterly. Um, 
was actually inspired by the passenger pigeon. Um, the whole press is called passenger pigeon. So the passenger pigeon was a species of birds that was at once extremely abundant in North America. Um, this text here that's inside of this book is written by Chief Pokagon. Um, and he was a poet and an activist who was living and working um, during, um, I think it was during the 19th century. Um, anyway, so in this text, he wrote a lot about how he lived with the passenger pigeon and how um, his community would um, utilize the species for a variety of different things, whether it be meat or different kinds of um, sort of um, fats, um, different kinds of clothing, different kinds of all, all these different kinds of uses and stuff like that. Um, and then he talked about how the species quickly fell into their demise after um, white settlers started to net them and also kill them during their brooding season so much that, you know, like 6,000 birds would die in a day. Um, and he talked about sort of the, the, the travesty of sort of using the species in this way. The thing that I really appreciated about this text was just how it acknowledged using the species um, and also the act of hunting and gaming and incorporating them into the daily life of, of the community that loved these birds at the same time. Um, and then, you know, after their demise, um, there was only a few passenger pigeons left. And in 1914, the last passenger pigeon um, was taken to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. And she was named Martha. She was at the Cincinnati Zoo. That was her last home. And now she is she lives there in for all of eternity, stuffed and given glass eyes. Um, so that's her right there on the right hand side. So in a lot of ways, I'm thinking about Passenger Pigeon Press and Martha's Quarterly as a kind of a resurrection of the species of birds. But the resurrection is in the form of publishing. And so you see here, here's uh, Chief Pokagon's text. And what I've done is I've laid it out in an accordion concertina book. And the way that you would read it is you would spread it out, but then there are all these swarms of birds that are folding out of the different folios. So again, um, asking this question of how do you read history? How do you read material that is written in a different kind of a timbre than um, what you might be used to? Um, how do you absorb that? How do you enjoy it? Um, and then also how do you, um, how do you pass it on? Here's another um, issue, you know, I'm, all, I'm often thinking about um, identity and I'm thinking a lot about notions of nationhood and statehood, you know, what makes someone of a certain nation, what makes someone of that nation if they have a particular ethnicity. And um, in this issue, this was done in fall of 2018, this is called Country First. Um, I really wanted to sort of explore these ideas of nationality and I collaborated with um, a ge geographer named Rocky Kawada and also um, a fifth generation shopkeeper named Mei Lum. Um, so Mei Lum is, um, she's a shopkeeper and she's also an activist in New York's Chinatown. And Rocky is a um, geographer whose scholarship is about um, the cotton industry in Tanzania. And um, both of these are actually explorations of Chinese identity to a certain extent. Um, so Rocky, um, Rocky's project is a lot to, has a lot to do with China's investment in Tanzania's cotton industry. So um, sort of Chinese soft power is very much present in this industry in Tanzania. And over the course of several years, Rocky has been documenting how these industries have been interfacing with the local community, um, the various fabrics that are being produced in Tanzania. And she had a large archive of different um, 
just photographs and writings and things like that that were related to um, this experience of observing um, Chinese uh, capital presence in, in Tanzania. And then May, um, May's family has been in New York's Chinatown for generations. And she um, has been sort of uh, reorganizing her family's archive um, of, they are shopkeepers. Their shop um, has all of these different um, Chinese goods um, that they sell to the community. These are things such as pots and plates and other different kinds of tchotchkes. And um, May um, sort of uh, led us into some of her grandfather's collections and also her grandfather's calligraphy. Um, May has been at the forefront of fighting uh, gentrification in New York's Chinatown. And so this is another um, way of thinking about Chinese American identity in this case. Um, so when you open this book, the two archives are presented side by side. On the right hand side, Rocky's, um, uh, sorry, May's photographs are enclosed and wrapped with her grandfather's calligraphy. And then on the left hand side, Rocky's photographs are enclosed in a piece of Tanzanian cotton created in one of these Chinese factories. This is a more recent issue. This is um, from Winter of 22, Make Me a World. And this was a collaboration with um, Nawan Nutang, who is um, a Thai artist, and also Herbert Hoover, which is actually not a real collaboration. It's more just um, bringing out some of the projects by Herbert Hoover um, from the U.S. National Archives. Um, so Nawan's, I was really uh, interested in Nawan's work um, called Busy Immortal, where he kind of created a whole world based on um, this video game called Civilization V, where players could build a world as if it were generative from leaders such as um, Augustus Caesar, Genghis Khan, and Napoleon Bonaparte. And what Nawan has done is sort of reimagine a world as if it began and it extends in the future, into the future, from, um, from Thailand. Um, and so this sort of weird world lives in the internet. And what I've done is I've taken this internet world and made it into a zine where Nawin's collection of all these different things that relate according to his own system of logic um, just sort of jump out at you as you flip the pages. This is juxtaposed to um, a text that I found um, called The Committee on Recent Economic Change. And this was a text that was produced um, in the 1920s. And this was during the boom years before the Great Depression. And the Hoover administration um, was very worried about um, whether or not people would not spend money. And so this um, committee went and did this, um, this sort of survey and research on whether or not people's desire to spend money and to consume would ever deplete. Um, and sure enough, this, this document um, demonstrates that indeed people's desires do not ever stop. And so this, I'm putting these two texts together as a way to kind of probe at notions of world building, world building as it is for ourselves, world building, building as it is for our communities, and in a more abstract way, what does world mean? What does world building mean to legacy building and the and the development of history? Um, this leads me to this project here. So this is the Color Curtain Project. Um, this was an elaborate uh, project that um, mostly worked with the papers um, on the Color Curtain, which was a book written by Richard Wright. Um, so one of the things that I think is that, that I think could be coupled with this question of how do you read his, uh, sorry, how do you read is also how do you read and experience history, right? Um, so the Color Curtain Project is an artist book and culinary experience that 
um, my friends and I collaborated on. My friends and I of this particular grouping, we come from all different um, practices. I'm an artist. Um, Seda Nak is a shopkeeper. Lovely Umayam is a nuclear policy analyst. Adriel Lewis is a curator and a poet. Desiree is an entrepreneur. Eric a lawyer. And Eric is a chef. And all of us came together because we had all kind of been really thinking about um, this word that was coming up a lot in 2018, which is this word of solidarity. And um, we really wanted to sort of think about what solidarity meant across different racial identities um, that, um, you know, that it, at first gleam seemed, it seemed like everyone was supposed to be in solidarity, but what does that mean? Isn't it actually quite difficult to be in solidarity? These are some of the rhetorical questions that we were asking. And um, we were really inspired by the Bandung Conference of 1955, which um, has been very much overlooked until now. I think it's really exciting that the Bandung Conference and the non-alignment movement has piqued the interest of so many scholars and artists around the world. Um, and for us, what we did was we looked to the Color Curtain Project by Richard Wright, who attended the Bandung Conference as an American Black expatriate living in Paris at the time. Um, the reason why we decided to make sort of like a banquet dinner was because we were thinking a lot about diplomacy and and sort of um, displays of of collaboration, displays of nationhood, displays of um, sort of like, um, I don't know, collaboration amongst nations. And so he, in the um, various bodies of archives that we looked at, that we found one picture of the Bandung delegates eating there. And here's another um, picture of the Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai eating with President Nixon. These are some of the pictures that we found um, uh, in the papers of Richard Wright at the Beinecke Library. You know, one of the reasons why we became so interested in Richard Wright, not just because he was American, but also a lot of um, his, his words in the color curtain and definitely in his papers were quite unvarnished. And I think that a lot of the questions that he was probing at related to religion, uh, race, um, were um, really uh, confusing to him. And it was something that I really appreciated reading his text. So what we did was we basically used a whole bunch of different elements from the archives of the color curtain and wove them and folded them in to the sort of procession of being invited and then coming to a very fancy dinner party. So these were the invite envelopes. And then when you open them up, you can see the, the top of one of Richard Wright's photographs that he took once he landed in Bandung. So there's the photograph and it's there as the lining to the envelope. These are just a variety of the fonts that we use. We were trying to be as specific as we could with the different type and artistic decisions that we made. So Courier and Optima were both from 1955, the year of the Bandung Conference. And Artisan is um, a font designed by a um, Indonesian typographer who's living in Bandung today. One of the coolest things that I saw in the archives was actually Richard Wright's press pass. Um, and I took the press pass, scanned it, and then made a sort of pseudo facsimile of it that was tucked into the envelope. Um, one of the other provocative things that was in the papers um, was Richard Wright's uh, initial questions that he came up with um, before he came to bend up. These were questions that he was just going to ask many people that he met there. And what we did was we basically made um, a similar press pack, but inside of the press package, um, we included all of Richard Wright's questions. So 
like I said before, this was a culinary and artist book experience. And basically the idea was that you would be given an artist book at your dinner setting. And then as you ate the different meals, which were created specifically for each chapter of the book, you would also be flipping the pages of this book according to when the meals were coming out or the entrees were coming out. So when you open the book, you were equipped with a knife and a pen, and these are reading utensils. And then each of the chapters of the book is um, broken up into um, flavors, and then each of those flavors relates to how you will read the book. So in this first chapter, this was a dish with using Chinese five spice. And then as you went through this um, material, there were drawings and then also a whole bunch of newspaper clippings that were found in the boxes that uh, were archived by the CIA that I found at the U.S. National Archives. So these were all um, newspaper clippings related to Bandung and the way that you would read it is the pages um, were reflective. And so you would read um, by using the reflection of the mirror pages. This is another um, chapter of the book that was read while eating chicken and mambo sauce. And this is where the, the, the attendees were able to answer the questions that we had posed from Richard Wright. There are also parts of it that you could scratch off and play with letters and shapes and designs and stuff. And then finally, in this chapter, Richard Wright's original notes about the color curtain um, was juxtaposed with an essay written by uh, the nuclear policy expert, Lovely Umayam. And then it was read while eating a dish called ketchup shrimp. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tammy, for the wonderful presentation. You've given a really tough act to follow up on. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Orang Asli and Orang Asa, who are the traditional custodians of the land and the waterways that we are currently gathered on today. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, so uh, and thank you also to Kat and the wonderful uh, NGS team who has put together the October gathering. I've forgotten how fun it is to be engaging with colleagues from different parts of the world in person rather than through the interface of a Zoom screen. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so how do I go about this in terms of... Okay, so I'm just... Um, so what I did, I'm going to just give a very quick uh, introduction to what I was doing before. So in addition to uh, my, I guess, scholarly career where I teach art history, uh, I was also doing a lot of public engagement uh, workshops, uh, principally focusing on resource building uh, it, uh, for the purpose of um, uh, promoting uh, public forms of um, scholarship on colonial history, right? Um, you know, thinking of how, uh, uh, you know, what are some of the uh, resources that are available online that would allow us to sort of like hack into uh, the pay behind the, uh, well, and access materials from behind the paywalls of academic um, publishing platforms so that it can be used by a larger sort of public. So the engagement was very much in person, convivial, and uh, focusing on, you know, largely community building from the ground up sort of like perspective. Can I have the next slide, please? And part of that was also to, you know, there's an artistic side to me that I eventually discovered, which was to then um, use some of these um, public domain uh, materials uh, to creatively reconfigure and uh, tell um, stories about uh, the Southeast Asian past uh, in this particular exhibition focusing on the tiger and navigator tells the story of an 18th century uh, sailor who uses music as a form of diplomatic currency uh, to um, uh, to enable sort of like favorable trade relations in the, the literal sort of uh, uh, coastal uh, port cities of Southeast Asia and we use that story to sort of like you know think about the sort of like tension between uh, 
anti-colonial resistance as well as the uh, forces of sort of like free will and free market capitalism that were slowly encroaching into this part of the world. Um, so of course, all these things sort of like came to a halt during the pandemic where I profess I turned really inward uh, where uh, it became a sort of like moment for me to recharge as well. Uh, I felt I was sort of like doing too much and going in all different directions during the pre-pandemic period. And um, I really took a two year break. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> so what I did was that, you know, during the first phase of the intense lockdown, I started picking up um, rudimentary sort of like skills in GIS mapping. Uh, it's something that I've always wanted to learn. It's not, it's, uh, you know, an interface that's used principally by geographers to do spatial analytical work. But increasingly, it's also something that is adopted by humanities scholars. And at the very early stage of my um, career, of course, the recourse was to use as many of the freeware as possible. And uh, what I'm showing you are, in fact, some of my earlier attempts at GIS mapping. I've since, I guess, I, I hope I have sort of like matured a little. And some of these projects are really old, and I wouldn't recommend, you know, following the way I sort of structured data in the past. It's actually very basic. Um, but it did sort of like provide me, these are really my stepping stones to where I've got to eventually. So because it was under lockdown, uh, Principally, uh, you know, Google My Maps and also the Google Street View was my uh, pretty much my recourse to, um, uh, you know, get myself out there in the world and remind myself there's a space that exists outside of the confines of my forum. So that time I was working on, uh, you know, an, an exhibition on uh, photo studios in Malaysia. So uh, part of the project uh, that I wanted to really sort of like, you know, do was to sort of like map out where all these photo studios are using public, uh, public domain um, newspaper and magazines that, uh, that uh, co uh, coincidentally were being digitized, uh, actively being digitized by a lot of the Singapore education institution and cultural institutions then. And through this exercise, then it, it sort, sort of gave me a taste of, uh, you know, what some of the interesting sort of like things I could begin to think of in terms of, uh, you know, playing with maps that I guess whenever I show this in an art context, uh, they always, um, there's always the sort of like critique and comment that uh, it's not it's not speculative enough. And there's always the assumption that, okay, uh, when you're dealing with sort of like GIS map, it's too, it replicates a sort of like colonial epistemology or maybe a Western-centric sort of like epistemology that I always thought, you know, maps, well, that, that's too much of a singular way to sort of like think of maps. You can really sort of like think of it as accommodating various sort of like types of agencies as much as it is you know, singularly representative of a particular mode of engaging with space, right? Uh, so I continue to work with this, and if I go to the next slide, uh, is because then, uh, for example, uh, during that time, uh, during the lockdown period as well, uh, Malaysia went through really extended periods of intermittent lockdown. So, you know, there wasn't just the first phase of lockdown, there was second and third phase of lockdown, and I, I, I've sort of like lost count in the end how many lockdowns that we had. But in one of those lockdowns, uh, I had the opportunity to work with an indigenous artist from the Temuan community in Malaysia. And that's pretty much a sort of uh, a, a map of where the extent of the Temuan country is. Of course, you know, you can see it's all very rudimentary and basic. You still have the national archive of Singapore, you know, uh, in <laughs> water map you know, uh, running across the entire map, but, uh, you know, we were able to sort of, like, use whatever resources and uh, in a very makeshift way to sort of, like, piece together a story that we felt was important to tell because during that time, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve was uh, being in the process of being degazetted 
uh, you know. So if you see the dotted outline sort of like area, that was the original sort of extent of the forest reserve in 1950, and it was significantly already reduced in 2010. And even that little parcel itself was um, slowly being sort of like taken apart. And what uh, my friend Shak Koyo was interested to um, tell was really the story of you know the seven villages that uh, that um, that continues to sort of like regard this forest as their sacred um, uh, homeland and territory. And what we did was then to subsequently layer this map with uh, the stories that he was telling me over Zoom, and it was almost like, uh, like a oral history sort of like, you know, storytelling session. If you go to the next map, where he then begins to sort of like mark and locate various trees in its approximate sort of like position. And when you click on any one of the animals and faunas, uh, the, the animals, it will sort of like show his artworks that are related to a particular locale and issue that he was touching on. And if you look at, uh, click on the trees, then uh, there would be all the sort of, it would be a recorded sort of like um, interview of all the different uh, tree species that uh, the seven villages would, uh, uh, would consider as sacred. And that area, they would sort of like call it the forest or gimba in the like, Tamuan language. But that area itself, they would call it the seven islands. And interestingly, if we look at the, and it was only through the through sort of like mapping technology where we can sort of layer uh, you know, the peat swamp, uh, the dark area where you see the peat uh, swamp that uh, surrounds uh, largely the uh, territories or where the Temuan country is located, that we begin to see that there are specific mounds, seven mounds where when it floods, it becomes almost uh, the seven island. And so you get the sort of like reference to the seven islands that they believe, uh, the Temuan people believe that the ancestors sort of come from. So these are some of the things that we were playing with and he continues to use uh, this interface that we have built uh, together uh, for his teaching and his sort of like sharing and, you know, the after on. So it became a tool for him to, to, to tell his own story and uh, yeah, uh, I, I thought this was particularly meaningful for me, even though, you know, it's, it's really bad GIS uh, by, by, by my standard today. It, it's still something that was very heartfelt and very meaningful for me. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I continue to sort of like, you know, rely on a lot of uh, newspaper reports where uh, from this, then I would also sort of uh, work on the history of ex exhibition, including historical ones, such as a uh, well-known uh, 1936 exhibition that was um, staged in Penang, and through these records, uh, pretty much uh, we were able to visualize how the exhibition looked like. So from the next slide. Uh, uh, so where it's located, next slide. And also how, in this location, what that, where, where the works were sort of like placed and things like that, and including, next slide, I'm just going to be quick, next. Uh, uh, including also where it's positioned in the city in relation to different kinds of like trade and cultural activities so that we could sort of like create different layerings and understand and situate a particular sort of like exhibition or site of exhibition within the cultural ecology of a city. Next, please. Uh, other projects, you know, other digital humanities sort of like projects I deal with was to, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, do text analysis or text modeling, comparing how I used to teach Southeast Asian art history, where there was a significant emphasis on, I guess, uh, specific sort of like keywords from the sort of like reading list that I used to provide compared to, you know, the changes where suddenly, uh, uh, the history of sort of like women, Borneo, and all these other sort of more marginal kind of like topics have become re-centralized in my later sort of like edition of the courses. And this was a moment for me to also reflect on the way I approach the pedagogy of like the region as well. I mean, uh, this, this type of visualization helped me to sort of like see more clearly, you know, what are some of the uh, emphasis, the new sort of like emphasis that I've been uh, placing in the teaching of the, the, the courses and help me to reflect on the progress, uh, the, the, the changes that's happening in terms of 
how I understand the region as well. Next, please. Uh, and if you're interested, I do have a substack where I do a lot of these reflections on some of the experiments, including a sort of like network graph of like all the power, power lines and, uh, and uh, infrastructure, sort of the, the power relations between various types of actors and players and institutions in the KL art scene, who's in the marginal position and how they connect to each other. But I think the kind of like analysis uh, of this sort of power relation is better sort of like experience if you sort of like, um, you know, read my blog reflection, which uh, surprisingly was quite uh, uh, popular. I think it's only because I approach it in a very layman way. Uh, I'm not a trained network graph analyst, so uh, having my sort of very layman kind of like approach to trying to understand what I can understand and read from a network graph like this uh, help uh, a lot of people to, I guess, appreciate or understand some of the, some of the systems in play when we play with Digital Humanities Project. So next, please. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this then sort of like translates to some of the teaching stuff that I've been doing. But, you know, uh, what I want to sort of like suggest that, uh, you know, uh, what I've been doing that's called variously digital scholarship, digital humanities, or digital art history, these are really sort of like catch-all terms that often refer to quite a disparate range of approaches and tools for research that rely on computational and digital tools for analysis, management, and presentation of scholarship yet. Yet producing some of these scholarship today is often associated with project management skills, use of technological softwares, hardwares, or familiarity with a knowledge infrastructure, as well as a funding sort of like system that uh, exceeds and overwhelms the kind of research that you know, humanity scholars were, or even artists were trained to undertake historically at an individual level. Right? So what I want to sort of maybe propose here is to ask if there can be a kind of poor digital humanities, or can a digital humanities or uh, digital art history be done poorly, right? Uh, you know, drawing on Abba, referencing Abba sort of like term that there can be, you know, the kind of like make do uh, where drawing on my own personal uh, exploration and thinking uh, that, uh, you know, uh, all the sort of like explorations I've been doing could, um, could, 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 so maybe sort of like uh, think of a, lot, a, a different way to think of the shape of knowledge for digital art history uh, that is perhaps more playful, that instantiates maybe more serendipitous sort of like game of chance central to the process of archival discovery and insight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Joel. Um, just so that everyone knows, I apologize, we're running a little behind schedule today. We did start later, so we're going to run about 15 minutes off schedule. Okay. Bye. Cool. Um, um, I'm Joel Short Spring. I'm a Wiradjuri artist from Gadigal country. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge um, traditional owners, the custodians of this land. I didn't quite catch who they were, but... Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I want to I wanna, um, pay my respects to their elders past and present um, and their history is ongoing on this country. Um, yeah, so start the video. It should just be playing. Um, I wish to, yeah, frame my practice. Probably the reason why I was asked to participate in this um, within a larger framework of what... Uh, a larger framework in which I'm sort of trying to negotiate art making practice, um, exhibitionary practices, publication, discourse. I work at the university back in Sydney at UTS. Um, into what is largely recognised as black or indigenous studies. Um, and exploring personally for me, um, given my background in art and architecture, um, looking at the potential of an indigenous materialist reading of art and architecture towards the efforts of uh, repatriation, uh, reparations, and land back. Um, so throughout my work, I've been particularly interested in what we might describe as sort of threshold conditions, um, similar to what Tammy mentioned earlier. Um, whether it is the distinction between certain material categories or the distinction between sort of aquatic or terrestrial space, 
um, distinctions between land title agreements, all sorts of things. Um, but I like to frame them within the context of Australia, which is a kind of ongoing politically fraught conflict, right? Like a, a colonial invasion. So looking at all of these things within the realm of conflict, uh, looking at the ways in which environmental factors are contributing or exacerbating to that conflict. Um, particularly in Australia, across multiple scales, um, we're reminded about how legal forms with all of their kind of arcane protocols and rules of procedure really is significantly challenged when it comes to producing accountability, uh, let alone any sort of justice. Uh, and time and time again, uh, we encounter the sort of incapacity of uh, legal mechanisms to really attend to the wrongs um, that are done and to produce any semblance of justice in the Australian context. Probably the most immediate example of this would be um, the findings in the last couple of weeks um, in the case of Kuman J. Walker, um, Zachary Rolf, the police officer who shot him, um, still walks free to this day. So yeah, I want to orient my um, presentation around the ways in which uh, refusal and the refusal of property, um, which present, and, and the way in which property sort of confers a kind of collective practice um, of the kind of black tradition in the country that I come from of refusal of property. Um, that is to say the kind of different forms of refusal that operate in conjunction with each other through time as well. Uh, so rather than thinking about what I will present to you today as a sort of individual kind of project, could we just stop the video just there? Um, I want to sort of place it within um, a kind of lineage and, and within a kind of context of these um, ongoing refusals um, to think about um, different ways of interpreting property. Um, so I'll kind of... For a while, I've been really interested in thinking about the kind of capacity for a project or an artwork to facilitate or maybe materialize the relations of um, reparations or uh, land back, uh, thinking about how an artistic or exhibitionary process could establish those relationships and maybe in, in the context of the PhD research I'm doing, looking at establishing um, maybe legal norms or different sort of discussions around property. So. Um, first, I'm going to give some context of where I come from. So I'm a Wiradjuri person with connections to UN country, but I, I grew up largely on Gadigal country in the Eora Nation, so a place now known as Sydney. Um, these all kind of are located within the southeast um, area of the continent. And when we talk about the southeast region, yeah, what we're talking about generally is New South Wales and Victoria. Um, the Murray-Darling River system and all of the areas connected um, to that. So that's like a huge part of the nation. Um, and for me, it's a really significant part of the country's story because it's where most Aboriginal people live. Um, it's also where most non-Aboriginal people live. But it's often the space in which sort of Indigenous history is um, least attributed and least recognised um, in the context of this. So. But when we think about the southeast, um, it's important to remember that it is the site, or situated within the southeast of Australia, or what is called Australia, is the uh, oldest man-built structure, um, so the oldest burial sites, um, some of the oldest ceremonial objects all come from this place. And so it's really significant, and this is a reason why I pay attention to it pretty exclusively within the context of my own research and the work that I'm doing. Um, so probably, if we're gonna be talking about archives and, and attention to history and attention to a particular focus in my own work, which has been a kind of heightened uh, sensitivity to ideas about absence and loss, uh, it's probably the best way to start is to talk about the ways in which objects have been collected in the past um, within museum frameworks. So in sort of the existence of kind of pre-colonial cultural objects speaks to like a very complex and um, violent history in many, many ways. And although we don't have a lot of accounts of how these objects came into possession, um, the collections of museums and institutions, um, some of these scenarios where acquisitions are made through largely violence, right? Um, for instance, the acquisition policy first enacted by Captain Cook and Joseph Banks, where people were essentially just shot at and their things taken after. Um, we can see here in this image by Cawthorne in the bottom right, um, he was an artist, a settler artist, who was working in Adelaide with um, Gurna people, and he kind of talks about um, how 
objects would be collected from Nut and Jerry people and Kerna people, Morgana people, and um, piled up, and then police forces would just walk all over them and destroy them. Um, and we need to kind of think about how, when these objects were collected, um, they were where the collections were held, and they were always kind of collected and presented in a European eye. If you want to start the video now, um, that probably works. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. If we could just skip a little bit further, there's a, like another slide coming up. Um, so the majority of these objects, um, sorry, I didn't time this perfectly. Now it's scrubbing, but not finding the... Anyway, yeah, let's just do that. Just play from here, thank you. Um, the majority of them um, within Sydney were held and displayed in the ethnographic court in the Garden Palace. Um, in Sydney, of course, a lot of these collections um, and objects like left after being displayed here. They were sold onto other collections kind of globally. But the Australian Museum kind of kept collecting these objects and storing them here in the Garden Palace. And some of you may know this and, and others may not, but um, this palace um, burnt down in 1882 and took all of the objects with it. Um, so there is a huge expanse of kind of colonial collection of objects um, that were kind of erased, like a hundred years of kind of contact narrative. Um, so here you can kind of see, sort of speaking about the ways in which these objects are displayed, um, a kind of block from a, a book that was produced in the early 20th century called The Evolution of Objects. <laughs> this is like a block plate written. And you can kind of see this sort of perceived genealogy of materials um, presented um, through how these collections were kind of gathered. And this is what my research is sort of interested in paying attention to, is how we can up unpick um, these particular um, projections onto material cultures of Indigenous peoples globally, but also particularly within the context of Southeast um, kind of Indigenous nations. Like if you look, you know, you look at this image, you've kind of got the most pure form of material culture in the centre and it's a, a stick. And then kind of radiating out from it are these sort of, um, you know, provocations of how well, particular different um, or diff more, uh, what would the word be, more... Um, developed, more, um, less archaic, less, you know, um, groups would create a, a kind of another object and sort of a more advanced um, group of people would produce a secondary, and I don't know, like the logical extension of that is what, a gun? <laughs> so um, for me, I'm sort of interested in thinking about this perceived relationship to genealogies of material through my own um, research and my own background, which is in architecture. Um, so the kind of history of architecture in so-called Australia, or at least a kind of part of that history in the southeast coast, is a history of cement, or more specifically, um, calcium oxide. Calcium oxide is also known as lime, or quicklime, and it's the result of like a simple process of lime burning, um, or burning of limestone, or other um, calcium-rich um, kind of things like shells or coral, um, these compounds made of calcium carbonate, when put under high heat, break down, and you can kind of see that sort of process. So it's sort of a cycle in which these materials are sort of broken down into their fundamental parts and then reused. Um, so it's kind of cement mortar is used in the construction of masonry structures, right? And kind of most um, in the composition of the bricks in most cases. And it is also the building agent in concrete, uh, which is the most ubiquitous building material in the world. In the context of that, of what we now know as Sydney, um, the cycle kind of operates at another scale, right? When you think about um, specifically where the lime came from and where it went. So in 1788, when British colonists invaded Kamei or um, Botany Bay, um, the first fleet brought minimal to no building materials, anticipating limestone to be readily available, um, along with other mineral resources. In the meantime, uh, manicured forests along the coastline were felled in lieu of timber structures, and the Sydney Cove landscape was denuded of any kind of useful timber. So, um, so the sort of material culture of the colony um, sort of changed the landscape fundamentally. But these improvised slab huts were, um, the, and the early masonry restructions were bereft of lime mortar, and they couldn't start, kind of stand the climactic and ecological tests of the kind of landscape. 
Um, but despite this, obviously, um, <laughs> colonial settlement persisted. <laughs> and um, through these insurgent moves, they set upon sort of the bountiful, though unrefined, calcium carbonate that existed along the coasts and estuaries of, uh, estuaries of so-called Sydney um, in the structure of shell middens. So uh, a shell midden is um, kind of in the Western framework described as a kitchen midden. It's a pile up of shells um, seen as kind of discarded refuse or waste. But this kind of limits the scope of their true intent. Um, within the context of Sydney's landscape, there were midden piles um, up to 12, um, to, to 12 meters tall. Um, this is kind of recounted not only in oral histories of um, indigenous people, but also um, within the um, archives of the Hyde Park Barracks and um, the network of the Australia's Sydney Living Museums. And so my sort of research is beginning to try to involve myself um, in the particular building um, archives of the Sydney, Mu Mu Sydney Living Museum network. Um, to begin to try to tell this story in another light and to think about um, the kind of materiality or the material processes of colonization um, in contact histories, but also like what the implications of that are. So yeah, um, there was these vast shell structures that were built up over millennia by traditional um, custodians um, all up and down the East Coast. Um, which obviously through their kind of persistence in the landscape also gained a huge amount of phenomenal and cultural value, sim you know, spiritual symbol symbology and all these other things. Um, they're also kind of climactic ledgers or registers. They held a lot of climactic information within them, kind of talking about what people were eating, how they gathered, the sort of changes in kind of climactic experience um, over time. So they're like really a rich resource. Um, but they were manipulated and exploited by um, colonizers and, and burnt um, in what you can see here in like shell um, burning of like shell middens through um, heat burning essentially. So just piling them all up on top of each other and burning them. Um, there is extensive history of these um, lamb kilns, uh, lime kilns all up and down the east coast as well. Um, but I think what's interesting, right, is it takes a particular mindset, um, a particular colonial lens, a particular reading of the landscape to see those objects as material, right? To see those objects as, um, as a mineral resource um, other than an inhabited, I would say, urbanism or architecture that um, pre-existed to kind of colonial expansion. So like the reading of these features in the landscape of settlers as matter and material and that led to this exploitation and destruction of these vast networks of middens and manicured forests um, is kind of gives every sort of building in Sydney um, its own sort of implication in this sort of relationship. Um, obviously, kind of as you can see in these slides, contemporaneous to the colonization of Australia, ge geology was going through a shift or being a sort of discipline that was relating to particular resources in the earth, um, but actually kind of went through the shift in, in creating positionalities of um, genealogies of race through time and enclosure in that way. Um, this is all sort of the precursor to what is a research project that is my PhD um, research at the moment. So as I sort of said, sort of the implications of this material history um, has led me to kind of begin to research, um, uh, particularly with the, in the context of my PhD, uh, the case study of the Hyde Park Barracks. So the Hyde Park Barracks was built in um, 1820. Um, it was you'll see in a, in a slide coming up um, that sort of like the Hyde Park Barracks was built in 1820 by Governor Macquarie to house the first um, prison population of the settler colony. Um, it was built to house 600 um, of the kind of colonial labor force um, is the first ever masonry building. It's the first clock. Um, so we could be kind of understood as time in and of itself, time in a colonial context arriving um, in Australia with the erection of that clock and the building of the, of the Hyde Park barracks. Um, the large sandstone and kind of masonry structure. Um, sort of, for me, it talks a lot not only to the sort of realities of the erasure of indigenous cultures within the context of um, the East Coast, 
but also it opens up an opportunity to re-examine these sort of colonial structures um, when we think about the materiality of these things pre-existing, um, being in and of themselves buildings that were used, or architectures or urbanisms that were used by indigenous people that were then manipulated and transformed um, into castral colonial buildings. Um, it kind of, for me, as, a, as someone who um, grew up in that place and, and very connected to the indigenous history of Sydney, and also a dis uh, trained in the discipline of architecture, it sort of removes a lot of full stops from particular statements that can be said about Indigenous history in Australia and sort of opens up um, an opportunity for people to um, maybe claim and recognise in Indigenous histories within the built environment. Um, for me, going forward, that ha is really significant because I'm quite interested in the ways that we can talk about um, different relationships or different recognitions of cultural materials within um, art and architecture. And so if we could think of a building material as a um, pre-existing cultural object that existed and, and, and persisted and belonged to an indigenous group, how might we mobilize that in kind of a kind of cultural opportunity or in a legal framework um, in a process of truth telling, in a process of repatriation, process of reparations and land back. Um, obviously the the uh, point of that research for myself um, is to begin to think about how we could create legal norms around these things by offering up opportunities to make, lay this clear, lay this bare. Um, I will be presenting alongside, um, with the help of my collaborator Thomas, who's here today, um, in, at UTS galleries next year, um, a presentation of some of this material. So as you can see in, in that um, image on the right, uh, that is the material archive at the Hyde Park Barracks currently. Um, that's a place that I've gotten to spend a bit of time at the moment, um, digging up and looking for um, pieces of material that would help kind of relate and help me tell this story. Um, there's a lot of written documentation that kind of confirms this, which is quite interesting because currently the existing narrative within the Sydney Living Museum's structure is um, quite antagonistic to that narrative and, and actually often um, explicitly states the opposite, um, where they're, they sort of actively, through the control of these materials, get to make a statement that there were no middens prior to colonial invasion and what they were themselves um, extracting from were existing or living um, oyster um, deposits, I guess you could call it. Um, it doesn't make sense on a biomass scale to me, <laughs> um, but it also becomes like more of a distinctive argument about ideology because at that point you're just arguing on whether or not you stole the history, whether you stole the history or whether you stole the future, right? Um, both are um, need to be held um, accountable and need to be spoken about. And I guess the kind of what this means to me as well is it begins to help us think about our urbanisms, particularly in Australia, but then maybe in a global context, of thinking through our urbanisms through its shafts and through its extraction sites. If we could think about um, our buildings not just as what they... Uh, architecture not just in, in, the, in the buildings that it creates, but the uh, beings and materials and places that it um, kind of destroys in those processes and to think of architecture in that expanded sense of being consisted of um, the places that we take things from as well um, could hold um, hopefully opportunities to think differently about our urban culture, particularly in the context that I come from. I'm going to stop it there um, and maybe we'll have some questions afterwards, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joel. That was um, really inspiring and a lot, giving us a lot to actually think about. Um, I'm alive to the fact that we are running to time for this panel, but I'm going to take another 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I'm just letting you know if you have to leave, it's fine. This panel is documented and the questions will be documented as well, so you can always catch us online if you have to leave. And we also have an online audience, so I invite questions through Zoom. They will be sent to me, so I will also be able to take questions through Zoom. Um, are there any burning questions from the audience? If not, I'm going to launch into one. Okay, great. Can we start? Um, before I ask a question for all of you, just because you've just presented, Joel, I was curious. In your research, have you found 
any of this material that was sort of reclaimed and used in buildings exported abroad because within the colonial structure, building material was shared across different colonies? Um, I mean, definitely timber. So tim timber, um, there's obviously particular genuses of timber that are quite a lot like mahogany. Mahogany is highly sought after um, in colonial buildings because um, uh, of its colour. Um, so there is, there's, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely uh, the task, um, which I have, I, I would say, probably at a very like cursory length, mm -hmm. engaged in looking at. Yeah. Um, for me, a lot of that situates like where you're looking um, in which archive, right? So um, there was quite a lot of like, Australia kind of operated off the benefit of having a lot of um, colonial bureaucracy education, right? And knew how to kind of hide and couch different ideas and terms within its own euphemisms and its own kind of legal and economic frameworks. Um, so Governor Macquarie um, paid himself out of the British, uh, out of British funds, and he created what was called the, what the police fund. Mm -hmm. That's what built the Hyde Park barracks. So you have to go into the ledgers of Governor Macquarie's police fund mm -hmm. to look for receipts of um, materials that were extracted in the mm -hmm. process of this. So often it's looking in. Um, banking ledgers and export um, and import sort of sheets to look at how these materials move. Obviously, there's a vast network in which the mahogany was moving back to largely probably like Liverpool and Newcastle um, in, in, the, in the UK and, and then from that point going elsewhere. Um, obviously, like so much cultural material has moved as well, right? Um, but that's also couched within different trading relationships between museums. Yeah. Wonder if I can mm. ask that question. To, uh, but, but that's such a sort of like fascinating body of research, though. And I was wondering if you can also share more. And I know that you're an artist, um, so perhaps one of the output of opening the archive is a, an artistic expression that then becomes a point of public engagement. Mm. But you know, having lived in Sydney for five years, so much of this landscape is pretty much invisible, right? Mm, mm, uh, mm. Or at least coming from an international student's perspective. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, you know, beyond knowing that maybe King Street it belongs to a kind of like song line. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, otherwise there isn't so much sort of like written into sort of a public perception of the no, landscape. Definitely. And I wonder, yeah. like, are there any initiative of your part to, uh, as you're sort of like opening a archive, what are the main means in which you begin to confront or mm. engage mm. Or, or, you know, compel a certain sort of like conversation. Definitely. Um, well, as a part of the presentation, like next year, hopefully, we'll have quite a lot of that material out of that archive and presented um, in a space within an architecture school. So hopefully held in relationship to um, people who could think about um, the history and, and the policy that kind of... Um, I mean, largely for me, and this is a bit of a tangent, but the sort of... The interest that I have explicitly with this site outside of the material relationship is how um, particular um, policy conditions, and this is probably, I didn't really get to it, I get to it before, but like if, coming from an anti-disciplinary perspective, my, my position towards architecture and built environment issues is largely a, the stuff that isn't spoken about in practice. It's all of the stuff that's decided beforehand, right? So cultural heritage policy, uh, land title agreements, where materials come from, those are all the things that I'm really very interested in within the kind of political conflict of, of Australia is colonialism. And these buildings are heritage protection buildings. Um, it's interesting to look at the typology of the prison as the kind of first buildings in Australia. So all of the oldest and heritage protection buildings are the prison typology and some of them still functioning jails and prisons. So up the coast of New South Wales, there is quite a few prisons that have this lineage connected back to mid 19th century um, settler ex exploration. Um, but they still work as prisons, you know? Um, and this, as I sort of was saying before about the kind of legal mechanisms not producing justice, quite interested in how um, in the context of Australia, a prison can be protected 
from um, refurbishment, from decommission and from change because it exists as a heritage listed building. Um, and that has really, that has real life violent implications for indigenous people. Um, for one instance, there's, um, I loathe to kind of call it a case study, but in the context of research, I, I don't know what else you'd call it, but yeah, there's an instance in 2017 where a man um, died in his cell um, and the sort of, um, in what is known as a death in custody and this, it's a huge political history within Australia kind of talking about that. One of the recommendations in um, 1988 in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was the removal of hanging points from cells. Um, it was found that this man had hanged himself in his cell um, and in the coronial inquest into his death, uh, when um, the police and the corrections facility were questioned on whether the hanging points were removed, um, they gave the defense that they couldn't because this prison was heritage listed, so they couldn't change the cells. They couldn't do anything. Um, so it kind of creates this like cascading ladder of accountability. Um, so this thing that's like really passive and that I teach to architecture students is acting like continuously, like very, very violently. So it's, it's, that, it's that stuff that I want to present um, as much as I'm interested in historical narration. I'm not a gadigal person, so it's also not my place to fully involve myself in what the outcome of that truth telling gets to be. Um, if there was going to be a presentation at the at, in next year, it would be to involve those perspectives and to have those conversations around these objects and not trying to like aestheticize that into a kind of art um, project so much as it is a uh, let's reckon with the reality of these materials and what they and what that means. Um, there's also lots of other outshoots that kind of, that kind of connects to, like the life way is connected to the food and the history that that means, and that's a really interesting um, place to explore for me personally. Would be like how to how to talk socially about you know the culture of eating in that place and the histories of that as well. And yeah, looking forward to yeah 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 yeah. Yeah no, thank you both. Thank you for the question, um, Simon. Okay, we are running at time, but I'm going to just close off this panel with one quick question for all of you. So opening the archive was really put forward with the idea of looking at how artists, researchers have gone into other archives and mobilized them and really at the one point um, engaged with the social function of what public archives, public collections are, but also address the sort of insidious histories that come out of these spaces. Um, but as Joel Yu and as well as when you brought up poor digital humanities as a concept for us to even start to think about, Simon, and even in the way that you work, um, Tammy, is a very clear question about and a very clear kind of delineation of navigating copyright and intellectual property. And this is a sort of renewed violence that comes so much out of our larger global system of capitalism. So I if you could just end us um, off today with maybe a quick answer as to the, the ways in which you navigate intellectual property in your work, what are the opportunities, or what are the moments of legal friction that are actually important? And the reason why we ask this question just for the audience here and the one on board um, online is that this panel is part of a larger workshop called Archival Intelligence, and it's really about strategies and, pr and, and um, strategies that artists have used as well as people who work in relation to the art world um, to navigate um, and create archives and through digital technologies or new te digital technologies, but also through navigating the existing legal structures. So I repeat the question, what are the moments of friction or the opportunities that come up with our current intellectual property system that feed into your work? Tammy, do you mind starting? A direct way to answer would be your Richard Wright project. Like, how do you navigate the two archives and get it get that into print? Yeah. Um, well, with us, I haven't actually met too much friction because the archive material itself is manipulated artistically, and so we kind of um, haven't really had much of an issue with um, reproducing those types of. Um, those types of materials. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Sometimes what we would do for Martha's Quarterly is when there is a copyright issue, um, I'll pay. I'll 
we'll pay for it. You know, we'll pay to use it, you know? Um, and then when there is an issue with whether or not it is in the public domain or if it's protected or whatever, then we use artistic means um, to manipulate it so that, that it is unlike the original. So in the case of Richard Wright, um, a lot of the thing, a lot of his documents and everything were cut up into different pieces. They were collaged together. Um, they were repurposed, and repositioned, and then stuck next to other texts that were um, not from the original. Thank you so much, Tammy. And if uh, yeah, so you know, I think thank you, Tammy, for your presentation. I want to just. Uh, really sort of like extend my appreciation and my admiration for what you do and in fact uh, as counterintuitive as it seems that you know going digital means working with you know very ledger like sorts of like uh, tabular sort of like data set I actually through that found a renewed appreciation for the craft like sort of like aspect of, of building those data sets in fact I see that as having some sort of like affinity to the craft-like uh, kind of attentiveness to the books that you are producing you know, in a very sort of like intuitive, intuitive sense. And I, I think in, in many ways, I'm also sort of like uh, building upon my interest in resource building and uh, the, the, the activities that I've been doing before. It's to uh, really sort of like make use of what is already in the public domain and in fact recognizing that there is a richness as much as there is of course it's incomplete and there's always sort of like more stuff out there but um, as a starting point to start thinking about the, 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 the possibility of producing some form of public uh, history or public history uh, those are sort of like good jumping off points uh, in, in thinking about what you can sort of like play with and think about. Thanks, Simon. Joel? Yeah, thank you both so much. I really got a lot from both of your presentations. I'm going to watch them again. <laughs> um, I think it's particularly we're dealing like with the building uh, or the archive of building materials at a, at a museum is interesting because they are largely um, inert materials from the perspective of the collections and the... Um, and to a certain extent, at least what I've seen at the Hyde Park Museum, is these things aren't really thought of um, as holding that much potential and energy. So there's a moment there to sort of mobilize. That's why I saw it as a, as, um, the loan agreement or the proposal of a loan agreement of a piece of building, like a piece of um, wall plaster or a brick. Um, is very different and has very less, have very different sort of relationships to display. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to, um, I think, gain some freedom or gain some ground in bringing these things out to the open. Um, it's different, I think, when you're going to begin to do like research and have to tell, you know, make explicit like the sort of things you're going to do to material. But in terms of presentation and how they will be laid, you know, looked at, um, it's they're relatively hands off because it's not it's not the stuff that they really care about. And they're not examining it through this lens. Um, but it is something that they control, right? So I would say within the context of indigenous claims on these objects within the Australian space, we're not even in a place where these things are being recognized or talked about yet. And I often get into a tension where I'm like, well, what, what is the process of codifying um, indigenous relationships to property in terms of um, intellectual property? Um, I'm quite interested in being antagonistic to the concept of property um, within the project as well. Um, it, like, I don't, it's not up to me because I'm, I'm not from these places where these places were extracted explicitly, but for me it's an opportunity to exercise a set of ideas within the legal frameworks of owning things and attributing them and recognising ownership to try and affect um, the market of building of buildings and property in a financialized state like the city, uh, the the marketability and the um, continued ownership of prisons <laughs> by the state. Those sorts, so being antagonistic to property as an idea is probably more what I'm interested in than um, the attribution of intellectual property for anyone specifically within that context. Because that's yeah, I mean that's that's a longer story. Yes.
All right. Thank you all. I wish we actually had more time to go deeper into this. Um, but I think the distinctions that you guys have brought out in relation to certain rights, in, re in relation to navigating the concept of property, but also commons when it comes to knowledge are, are things that we need to think about, but are also are very, um, there are opportunities that artistic practices provide in opening this up as well in educational practices. So thank you. Thank you to Tammy, Joel, and Simon for joining us today. And thank you to, for everyone here who is also taking the time today. We apologize for running late. There are more problems for, uh, sorry, no, more programs for October gathering today. So I recommend that you stay, um, continue on with us and catch our next set of programs. All right, thank you so much. Yeah,